Sister Claire Crockett, servant sister of the Home of the Mother, alone with Christ alone. Chapter 18, Our Lady Among Us. It was study time in the afternoon in Mary Immaculate's school in Belmonte, Spain. The older girls were somewhat distracted while they studied, as usual, but they were getting some homework done. A few days earlier, Sister Claire had mentioned to one of the sisters, I think this house is missing a bit of joy. The sisters had recently corrected the girls for leaving their rooms and hallway a mess. The girls had really made an effort since then and their rooms were much tidier, but Sister Claire felt that Our Lady wanted her to help her brighten the atmosphere and lift their spirits. I have a plan, Sister Claire declared, laughing to herself as she envisioned the result of her scheme. The girls would definitely enjoy this. She explained it to all the sisters as she herself went to the first hiding spot. As the girls continued their studies, Sister Anna Maria went in, interrupted them and called their attention with a great deal of drama. I really can't believe it. Your wardrobes are once again a total disaster. How many times do we have to tell you? When will you learn to be orderly and clean? Now I'm going to take you up one by one to your rooms so you can see what I'm talking about. The girls could not believe it. They had tried so hard to clean their rooms. Sister Anna motioned to one girl who reluctantly got to her feet and went with the sister upstairs to her bedroom. As they walked in, Sister Anna continued, I'm so disappointed. Take a look in your wardrobe and tell me if you call that orderly. As the young girl opened the door of her wardrobe, Sister Claire, who was hidden inside with a camera to record her reaction, jumped out and joked with a girl who could not help but laugh. A few days later, she put together a video with all of their reactions entitled The Laughter Experience. The summer of 2011 had been very busy for Sister Claire. In May, she had the grace to travel to Rome for Pope John Paul's second's beatification. In June, she did spiritual exercises in silence, and in August, she took part in World Youth Day in Madrid with Pope Benedict XVI. At the end of August and beginning of September, she spent 10 days in her house in Alcalá de Guadaira, Seville, to substitute the sisters there so they could do their own week of spiritual exercises. She saw all of these experiences as a gift from the Lord, and she thanked him for them. Above all, she received a grace during the spiritual exercises that would mark her way of living the following year. Let us hear her explain it in an email to Father Raphael. Once, during spiritual exercises in Barcenia, I received the grace of interior recollection, and the Lord permitted me to rest in his heart. I experienced such peace, joy and love that I wanted to shout out to the Lord, I love you. I felt that he answered me by saying, shout it out to me with your life. When the Lord gives me the grace of allowing me to dwell inside of him or of experiencing his fatherly embrace or the gaze of the Virgin, it makes me long to be with them. When all the servant sisters get together with you or we have a celebration or I have to do something that I enjoy, even though all these things are pleasant, I know that the joy and happiness that these moments bring are nothing in comparison to the profound joy that God strongly brings to the soul. This helps me to remember that all things pass. God alone suffices. Or as Father Segundo Lorente said, the only consolations that truly fill our soul and never pass are the divine consolations, never purely human consolations. It's so true that the best moments of my life have been with the Lord. Many times this shouted out to me with your life comes to my mind when I'm with the sisters during lunchtime, when I have to do something that I don't like, when it's cold, when I'm tired, etc. In September, Sister Claire received her assignment for the new school year, Belmonte, Cuenca, where she had spent a few months right after her first profession. We run a home there for girls from difficult family situations. This year, there were 18 girls, the youngest age 6 and the oldest age 17. Just four days after her arrival, Sister Claire wrote, This year the Lord has sent me to Belmonte. When we arrived, Our Lady of Grace, the town's patroness, welcomed us to Belmonte. We arrived on our feast day, September 10th. I am at peace and very happy. The fact that the five sisters arrived in Belmonte on the feast of Our Lady of Grace patroness of the town was no coincidence. Our Lady's presence would be especially strong throughout the school year. She would be the true queen and mother of the house, as the sisters had asked her upon their arrival. She helped the sisters form a real family atmosphere. 
They took care of all the girls' needs, physical, emotional and spiritual. They encouraged them in their studies, educated them, gave them intellectual and spiritual formation, washed their clothes, played games with them and organised great birthday parties. But the most important task was to take care of their spiritual life by encouraging them to receive strength from the sacraments and prayer. From the very beginning, Sister Claire was in her element. The work in Belmonte was perfect for her to fulfil her desire to give it all to the Lord. She loved having no time for herself, as she wrote Father Raphael a few weeks after her arrival. Many times I asked the Lord to never let me rest here on earth, that he send me a lot of work, because when I'm working for him, I don't waste time thinking about myself. Here in Belmonte, he has given us a lot to do. I love ending the day tired, but filled with an interior joy, knowing that if I am tired, it's because I have served the Lord. The community life among the sisters also helped her. She wrote to Father Raphael, In the community, we help one another. There is an environment of peace and joy, and we laugh a lot. This joy and peace amongst the sisters was what permitted them to transmit these fruits of the Holy Spirit to the girls. She would constantly come up with songs, skits, jokes, anything that could lift the girls' spirits. The songs often were silly things that did not say anything of particular value, but that helped the girls to laugh. One example is a slow romantic song about the town of Belmonte that she wrote shortly after her arrival. Belmonte, Belmonte, I love you, I need you. Belmonte, Belmonte. Other times, they were just as simple, but with meaningful lyrics such as The Rescuer, composed for a festival on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in December. We all mess up every once in a while, and we say no instead of saying yes, and we end up doing what we shouldn't do, in our lives, we have seen her act, and this is why we want to sing her this song. She comes to rescue us, our rescuer, faithful mother. Our rescuer, thank you for your daily help. Our rescuer, do not hide yourself from me, rescuer. This last rescuer she sang in a joking whisper. At the beginning of the school year, she was the only sister in the community who played the guitar. She improved her guitar skills very quickly and gained great agility. When a sister who played the guitar joined the community in January, she was amazed to see how Sister Claire would often make up the chords, not playing them in the traditional manner. It still sounded fine. One song she learned to play this year was a civilian song to Our Lady of Rocio. Long live Andalusia the rose that Our Lady chose, and the girls always asked her to sing it. She would later sing on many other occasions, continuing even in Ecuador. Sister Claire was assigned to help the younger girls in their study time. In general, they were not at all interested in learning. She constantly came up with new ideas to help them study and make the study time not be a total bore. When they had to learn things by heart for exams, Sister Claire made up songs to help them memorise whatever they needed to know. She would also take them out for breaks to the patio so that they could move around or play the guitar and sing with them. One of the sisters says it was funny to watch Sister Claire reprimand the girls when they got low grades. She would suddenly put on her angry face, which included raising one eyebrow, and say things like, And what are you going to do when you grow up? No one is going to want to hire you, not even to sweep the streets or manage a cash register, because you're not responsible. You have to become a real woman. That's what God wants. Sometimes it was not easy for her to stay serious, especially when she knew the girl was not purposefully being rebellious. She had to be careful not to look at the other sister, because if she did, they would be in danger of laughing about Sister Claire's angry face and her raised eyebrow. Clearly, if they did start laughing, the little girls loved it. There were other moments when Sister Claire did not at all feel like laughing when she had to reprimand the girls. Sometimes she was at a loss at what to do to help the girls change their attitude. On one occasion, one of the sisters found a little girl outside the study room staring up at a picture of Our Lady with an expression of sorrow on her face. Sister Claire had sent her there to talk to Our Lady so that Our Lady could work the miracle in her soul since all human efforts had failed. She wrote to Mother Anna about these difficulties. Not long ago, during study time with the younger girls, I noticed that for the past week they hadn't been making any effort whatsoever to study and they were doing their homework very badly. Every day during that week we started off with the usual if you aren't responsible talk and after a few days I was sick and tired of it. I wasn't discouraged but I was kind of fed up. While I was in prayer I felt that the Lord told me that I had no right to get tired and give up. That on the day of my perpetual vows I had told him I wanted to spend my life for the youth and now what? When the Lord tells you something like this 
and with a rather serious tone, you have to react quickly. It may seem like something small, but it made me and is still making me react and give more of myself. Hopefully I can help make life easier for others, especially for the sisters. Another reflection that helped her not to get discouraged when the girls were irresponsible or behaved badly was to remember the Lord's constant mercy with her. In an email to Mother Anna, she wrote, One thing that I have realised is that I should never let myself be moved by my lack of virtue, such as anger, fury or tiredness, when I am with the girls. It's true that they mess up, that they can be very obnoxious, and that there are times when they make you go crazy. But I know that I am not any better than they are, The Lord has had so much more mercy with me. I cannot judge them or their intentions, only God knows. But I do have to correct them when it's necessary, with meekness, with love, and if God wants, with a sense of humour. For me, it is important to always try and see the positive side of things and be able to laugh. It's very good to laugh, and I think it is important that when we are in community, especially here, that we laugh. St John Bosco used a preventative method in his work, with young boys. Instead of waiting until he had to correct bad behaviour, he jumped ahead and did whatever he could to help them desire the good. This method seemed to come almost naturally, or rather by the working of the Holy Spirit, to Sister Claire. It was very important not to let sadness enter and take root in the girls' hearts. As soon as she or one of the other sisters noted that the girls were down, or that something was not right in the general atmosphere, they started planning something to lift up their spirits and to help them to continue the fight for holiness. In mid-November, the sisters realised that the devil was tempting the girls with sadness. To avoid the attitude of complaint from spreading amongst the girls, Sister Claire quickly came up with a solution. Our Lady's Mafia. During several weeks, the sisters would suddenly appear during the girls' lunchtime with black jackets and hats on over their habits with mafia-like music. On the first day after their appearance, Sister Claire explained who they were and how things would work with a great deal of drama. We are our lady's mafia. We're her BFFs. Whenever she needs something, she comes to us. She had the girls laughing from the start. She then went on to explain how to play the game. It was a simple way to break the routine and uplift the general environment. Later on in the school year, the girls once went off to school and left their rooms a mess. They had not done any of their other chores properly either. The sisters came up with a plan. When the girls returned from school... They would find out that the rest of the day was entitled A Day in the Sister's Shoes. There was a note for each girl on her bedroom door with an explanation of what she had to do. Each was given a chore or task that the sisters normally did, such as folding clothes in the laundry room. Then a sister would arrive at some point, imitating the girls, for example, by searching frantically amongst the clothes, unfolding and wrinkling everything. At mealtime, they had to serve the sisters, and the sisters acted with bad manners, grabbing the food directly off the platters with their fingers, or demanding more without saying please. The girls could not help but laugh as they watched the sisters imitate them, but it served as a wake-up call. Sister Claire came up with a skit for the end of the day. On the following day, there was a hike and barbecue planned with the girls. Sister Claire set out with the first group and a second group set out soon after with another sister. Sister Anna Maria La Pena, the superior, called Sister Claire shortly after they had left and told her that the girls had once again left their rooms a total disaster. The sisters had tried to correct them in a fun way, but the girls had not made the slightest effort to change their behaviour. Sister Anna Maria decided they were going to have to call off the outing. It would not make sense to spend a whole day having fun when the girls had ignored the correction of the previous day. When Sister Claire finished talking to Sister Anna, all she said was, I can't believe it. She immediately called the girls around her and told them very seriously how disappointed the sisters were that they had not learned yesterday's lesson. The walk home was in silence and they went to their rooms upon arrival. She knew the girls had good intentions. They had simply been too lazy to put them into practice. Sister Anna Maria remembers how Sister Claire had a gift to de-dramatise situations. Truly amazing if we recall that she was such a drama queen when she was young. Even though she knew they needed to be grounded for the day, she came up with an idea. The sisters could write a letter from Our Lady to each girl and put it under their doors, encouraging them to improve and change. Later that evening, once they had had time to reflect on their misbehaviour, she planned a fun dinner with the girls so that they would not get too discouraged. Her love for the girls moved her spontaneously to put into practice St Paul's advice. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. 
Sister Claire especially helped one 13-year-old to overcome sadness and discouragement. In spite of the fact that she had already spent four years in Belmonte with the sisters, she had never truly believed in God. The summer of 2011 had been extremely difficult for this young teenager. She arrived in Belmonte with a strong depression and her self-esteem was at rock bottom. During the whole first month at the school, she never smiled or interacted with the sisters or any of the girls. Sister Claire later told her that it seemed like she did not know how to smile. Our Lady would soon transform her with the help of Sister Claire. The sisters had organised an international rosary and groups of girls with the help of a sister had to prepare a mystery of the rosary in a particular language. Sister Claire's group was going to pray their mystery in Irish and this young girl was with her. I don't know when it happened, but all of a sudden I started laughing with Sister Claire like never before, after months of complete silence. At that moment, I felt that our Blessed Mother used Sister Claire to show me her love in such a way that I was completely amazed. If you have never experienced this kind of love, you can't even imagine how deep it is. From that moment on, I had a conversion. I wanted to be good and pleasing in God's eyes, and Sister Claire helped me. Our Lady transmitted her love to the 13-year-old through Sister Claire's joy, opening her heart to hope. And this was not the only moment when Our Lady made herself present in a special way during the year. There were countless occasions. None of the girls or sisters in Belmonte that year will ever forget their pilgrimage to Lourdes. In March 2012, many of the girls had been desiring to go to Lourdes for some time, but it had not been possible. This year, the Board of Directors of Mary Macklet School gave its permission towards the beginning of the year for a trip to Lourdes. The sisters waited until February 11th, the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, to tell the girls about it. First, they called all the girls into one big room, where each had to wait for their appointment with a doctor, one of the sisters. The doctor then diagnosed each girl's spiritual illness and informed her that she had to be pushed on a stretcher, which was a mattress, down the stairs to the head doctor, who was Our Lady. As the girls slid quickly down the stairs on the mattress, laughing and screaming, the sisters sang a song that Sister Claire had written to a country melody that said, Our Lady of Lords, Queen of Our Souls, come and cure her. Beneath the statue of Our Lady, there was a small basin with water from Lords, which the sisters would sprinkle on each girl. At the end of the day, after a moment of silent prayer to Our Lady, the girls were very excited to find an invitation to Lords at the foot of the statue. The following month was full of preparation for the trip. Sister Claire was in charge of finding accommodation in Zaragoza, Spain, their first stop and then in Lourdes. She started making phone calls, pulling out all her long lost memories of French from school and she invented what she did not remember. It was very difficult as everything was expensive and they had a very tight budget. She called parishes, schools, convents and pilgrim houses. At one point she called a community of sisters she had met in Valencia, knowing they had communities in France. Unfortunately, the closest house they had to Lourdes was six hours away. Yet the sister who spoke with Sister Claire encouraged her, Do not worry, you will find an angel who will speak Spanish and French and he will help you. She said it with such conviction that Sister Claire knew these words were prophetic and from the Lord. She trusted that they would find an angel to help them in Lourdes. Soon the accommodation problem was also solved as a friend of the home of the mother paid for a house they could stay in at Lourdes just five minutes away from the grotto. March 15th was the first day of the pilgrimage. In the morning, Sister Claire wrote in her notebook, This afternoon, God willing, we are going to begin our trip to Lourdes. Right now, I feel a little cold, or a lot, spiritually speaking. However, a few weeks before, she had felt that Our Lady was asking her to go to the baths. She had never done so before, although she had been to Lourdes five or six times. First of all, because I was too embarrassed, and second, because it was never something that attracted me. But now, she writes, I want to do it, whatever it takes. One, out of love for Our Lady. Two, to show her my trust in her. Three, to be healed from whatever she wants to heal me from. She prays that she will not live the pilgrimage to Lourdes superficially, only looking out for my own interests and what is good for me. And she asks... Lord, I pray for the intentions of all the sisters here and for the girls. Grant us the grace of experiencing your mother and of completely falling in love with her. The bus trip was very long, around nine to ten hours. At one point, the bus driver got lost, making the trip even longer. All the sisters spent the trip talking, singing and playing games with the girls. They would do interviews with them on the microphone, helping to create a joyous atmosphere of expectation as they approached the encounter 
with her heavenly mother in Lord. This is where Sister Claire invented a silly, comical superhero named Sorclore. She's stronger than a white buffalo. She jumps higher than a rabbit. She's smarter than the prince of the forest. The content of the stories was always ridiculous, such as a nun crossing a street and jumping in a puddle, for example. But she would adorn the story with so many funny descriptions that she had the older girls on the floor laughing non-stop. The first thing they did upon arrival was visit the baths. There was no line at all and they were all able to enter very quickly. Sister Claire was the first of the sisters to enter, generously responding to Our Lady's request. Sister Claire writes, I bowed down before her, offering her my life. She was very present. I asked her the grace to be crazy for her and to always do what she asks of me. There are things that Our Lady can ask us to do which may seem crazy to the world, but I know that I must always be willing to take that step and do even ridiculous things if she asks me to. Our Lady asked St. Bernadette to eat grass in the grotto. Was that foolishness? Was it crazy? No, she knows what she is doing. After this, they got lost again as they tried to make their way towards the house where they would stay. Sister Claire had found a room for Pedro, the bus driver, in a pilgrim house run by a community of sisters. When she had called weeks earlier to reserve his room, she still did not know his name, so she had reserved it in her own name. Due to the delay caused that morning by the hours spent trying to find the road to Lourdes, Sister Claire realised they would arrive later than foreseen. She tried to call the sisters from the pilgrim house in Lourdes to let them know that Pedro would be arriving late, but she was unable to contact them. After dropping off the girls and three of the sisters at their lodging, Sister Claire and another sister accompanied Pedro to the pilgrim house. It was already quite late. They entered and found all the lights off in the reception. What could they do? All of a sudden, a priest with an elegant black cassock appeared. Sister Claire whispered to the other sister in Spanish. He looks like St. Jose Maria Escriba. He overheard her comment and explained in Spanish, with a slight French accent, that he belonged to Opus Dei. Sister Claire thought to herself, could this be the angel we were expecting, who would speak French and Spanish and who would help us? She then proceeded to explain that their bus driver had to stay there, but that they did not know his room number. The priest was also a guest in the house, as he was giving a retreat in Lord to a group of young people. But he told them not to worry. He went over to the reception desk and looked at the reservations. Is his name Pedro Crockett, he asked. Sister Claire could not hide her astonishment. How could Pedro's name be written on the guest book? If she had not told anyone his name, they only knew hers. She managed to respond. Yes, his name is Pedro. The priest looked at the keys. There are a lot of keys here. I'll give him the key to the room right next to mine. That way, if he needs anything, he can let me know. The priest then proceeded to the kitchen to find something for Pedro for dinner. Pedro was a bit concerned about how the sisters would get back to their own house. The priest, whose name was Father Mark, offered to take them so Pedro could eat dinner and get some rest. While they were, they were on their way, Sister Claire asked Father Mark if he would be willing to give the girls a short talk, and he agreed. Upon arrival, they knocked on the door and two of the sisters opened. Sister Claire announced with great joy, He's the angel. we found the angel. Father Mark gently shrugged his shoulders with a smile as the sisters invited him inside. It was as if he knew that God had sent him. He was able to speak to the girls some time, encouraging them to clean their souls through a good confession. Before leaving, he gave them a blessing in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit and of the Holy Angels, winking at the sisters. It was already quite late, around ten at night, with all the intense events of the day. Somehow the sisters had not eaten anything since that morning. In situations like this, Sister Claire would normally have had an automatic migraine as a result. This time she felt fine. She was floating with joy like a little girl, thrilled by God's unquestionable intervention in the day's events. The following day, Sister Claire went with another sister to the pilgrim house where Pedro was staying. They found the nuns who ran the house and Sister Claire began to explain what had happened. We are so sorry that we arrived late last night. We tried to call. The nun interrupted her. But you did call. One of you called me and told me that you had gotten lost and told me the bus driver's name. Once again, Sister Claire was in shock. What was the voice like? she asked. It was a woman's voice, a very tender voice, the nun responded. Neither Sister Claire nor any of our sisters had managed to contact these nuns the previous day, and yet the nuns knew they would arrive late and they knew Pedro's name, which was absolutely impossible. 
It was obvious that Our Lady's hand was in all this. As a good mother, she continued to manifest her presence throughout the rest of the trip. She was present even in little details. After a hike to the mountains, a torrential downpour began as soon as they got on the bus. On another occasion, they arrived right in time for Mass, despite the unforeseen delays on the bus ride. Our Lady had everything perfectly calculated. Upon their return to Belmonte, Sister Claire wrote, It's so sad we have to leave, Lord. I wanted to stay there with you, dear lady. Thank you for the peace and interior joy that you have granted me and that I notice even more now that I have returned and am here in Belmonte. Visiting a shrine of Our Lady always reminded her of Garabandal and filled her with a desire to have a shrine there as well. Our Lady, through the intercession of your servant and son, St. Jose Maria Escriba, grant us the grace to be able to build a shrine soon in Garabandal. How noticeable is your presence in these places. Grant me light to see why you have brought me there. I want to trust in you always. Live among us. One day, shortly after returning from Lord, Sister Claire was putting order to the storage room in Belmonte with Sister Anna Maria, her superior. In one moment, Sister Claire turned to her and said, Sister... I want to say sorry for not helping you on the bus. Sister Anna could barely hide her astonishment. What in the world could Sister Claire be referring to? She had spent both bus rides organising games, talking to the girls, singing songs non-stop. I'm sorry I didn't help you write a song for Our Lady when we were arriving in Lourdes, Sister Claire added to clarify. Then Sister Anna Maria remembered that towards the end of the trip, when they were just two hours from Lourdes, she had suggested they write a song for Our Lady, Just after grabbing the microphone and sharing her idea, there were tons of curves and many of the girls and sisters began to feel a little sick. She had suggested several different melodies and lyrics, but since everyone was feeling so sick, she decided to let them rest. Soon afterwards, the bus arrived in Lourdes. The entire pilgrimage had been so full of heavenly blessings and joy that Sister Anna Maria had not even remembered the unwritten song. No, don't worry, Sister Anna responded. You were all car sick. It was totally understandable. Why was Sister Claire so repentant over such a little detail? She did not just want to give what was reasonable on a human level. She wanted to obey out of love for our Lord, no matter what was asked of her. Obedience is possibly what stood out in Sister Claire the most this year. Sister Anna Maria was younger and seemingly less experienced as a sister. Looking at things on a human level, without the supernatural vision of faith, It would seem that Sister Claire would have difficulties in obeying her. However, this was not the case. Whenever she would ask Sister Claire to do something, she would always respond with a joyful, of course, indicating her availability for whatever was needed. Sister Anna Maria says, I could see in her what we profess, prompt, joyful, universal and constant obedience. Her obedience was not passive or limited to doing what she was told. As we have seen already in the story so far, she was always on the lookout to suggest ideas that could help the girls. She did not insist on her ideas, however. If Sister Anna Maria said no to one of her ideas for whatever reason, Sister Claire never showed signs of frustration, but accepted it with peace. During this year, there were two saints who particularly helped Sister Claire to have this attitude of total generosity. She writes to Father Raphael, I have two helpers whom I love and who encourage me a lot. Saint Teresa of Avila, of course, and Father Segundo Lorente. This summer I read a book that contains the letters he wrote to the Carmelites and it helped me a lot. He was totally in love with the Lord, surrendered, prayerful, and at the same time very down to earth and with a sense of humour that makes you laugh out loud. Now I am reading another book by him, Forty Years in the Arctic Circle, which is also helping me a lot. He comes to my mind during the day and I ask him, What do you think about this? What would you do in this situation? And I have received many graces through him. I think about the things that he did for the Lord and it fills me with the desire to do the same and to try and be like him. And she ended another email a few months later with a quote from Father Segundo Lorente. I'm going to finish off with a quote that I recently read from Father Segundo Lorente. What an amazing man. When I grow up, I want to be like him. Trembling and at the same time full of courage, I say, Lord, use me as you wish whenever you wish and wherever you wish, without paying any attention to my foolish complaints. Lead me through rivers or tundras, through ice or shrubbery, by day or by night. I will never let you down, even if I'm eaten alive. I will do anything for you. And it's as if I hear somewhere inside, I don't know where. Secundo, don't speak foolishness. Keep quiet and continue. I also say these things to the Lord, and he responds in the same way. Action is love. 
Sister Claire also explained how St. Teresa of Avila helped her. In prayer, I am reading a section from the complete works of St. Teresa of Avila called The Relations. Ever since I started reading, it has been helping me to be united with the Lord. There are things that the Lord says to St. Teresa that I have read and meditated, and at times I feel like he is saying exactly the same to me. For example, Thou seest me here, daughter, it is I. Show me thy hands. And he seemed to take them and put them to his side. And he said, See my wounds. Thou art not without me. Life is short and passes soon. Labour not to hold me enclosed within thyself, but to enclose thyself within me. Resist not, for great is my power. Thinking about these things makes me remember that I have to live my day on another level, even though I am with the girls studying in the dining room or doing activities with them. First, I have to be with the Lord, and in order to be with him in the midst of so much hassle, I have to do small things, such as make the sign of the cross slowly, sing him a song in a low voice, turn and look at a crucifix or at a painting that is hanging on the wall, pass by the chapel to genuflect and say, I haven't forgotten you, Lord. These small things mean so much to the Lord and to me as well. These acts of love for our Lord were not limited to quick prayers or exterior motions. She also tried to make sacrifices of love, offering to him little things that were difficult for her. The other day I had a new experience. I ate pig ears and tripe. I assure you that quite a few souls went on a direct flight from purgatory to heaven that day. There are other moments when the souls of purgatory love me a ton. When I have to get up in the morning, it's so hard. When I have to tell the second grade girls a thousand times that 10 minus 7 isn't 60. Or when I have to go around the house a hundred times looking for the key to the storage room and it ends up that I had it in my pocket the whole time. The Lord allows these sorts of things in his providence so that I can see how I'm getting on. Sister Claire was very conscious that the principal aspect of her life was her relationship with the Lord and her time alone with him in prayer. She spent many hours meditating on the prodigal son during this year and she suffered to see how little she responded to our Lord's mercy. She wrote in her notebook, I see that I lack generosity, that I let myself be guided by feelings and convenience. I forget you. I don't do things out of love for you. I don't believe or I don't trust in your mercy. Our Lord, however, soon taught her that she had to accept her own misery and to not be prideful in her desire to be perfect. She wrote to Father Raphael, For a long time I thought that in order for the Lord to be able to look at me, I had to be perfect. Since I would fall so many times and I considered myself to be so imperfect, I didn't understand why the Lord permitted this. I truly thought that if I was so stained by sin, it was difficult for the Lord to simply look at me, and for me it was hard to look at him. I felt, and at times I still feel, that I let him down, and I feel ashamed of my poor and miserable love. One day I felt that the Lord sadly said, Those who are healthy don't need a doctor. I have come to save the sick. In the parable of the prodigal son, it says that when the father saw his son, he went running to meet him, which is what the Lord is constantly doing with me. It continues saying, he embraced him and kissed him. Then the son began to say, he only began, he couldn't continue what he was saying because his father stopped him with his kisses. The Lord acts in the same way with me as well, teaching me always with delicate tenderness and never-ending patience that his mercy is so much greater than my sin and misery, that he doesn't look so much at my faults as to the benefits I receive from them, if I use them to humble myself before him and become small and kind. After all these experiences and lessons from our Lord and Our Lady, the school year in Belmonte came to an end. She had experienced that he asked her to give until it hurt, like the poor widow in the Gospel, and made a sincere effort to do so. She was especially sorrowed by the fact that she had not managed to pray the rosary as faithfully as she would have liked. It hurts me to know that there have been days when I did not show the Virgin my love in this way, and she summarises her experience of the year with this entry in her notebook. The year is almost over. The truth is that I like being here a lot, but I am willing to do whatever you want. The words of Father Mark, the angel, often come to my mind. When difficulties arrive, I offer my help and I say, Yes, Lord, whatever you want. Thank you for the complete for the good examples that you have put in my life that help me and encourage me to continue forward. Thank you for your never-ending pardon. Thank you for all that you have done for me this year. Thank you for the opportunities you have given me and the confidence you have placed in me in spite of everything. Now the if onlys. If only I could love you more. If only I could be in your presence all day long. 
If only I could speak loving words to you when I am alone. If only I could have more faith in you. If only I could experience fear and horror at the very thought of offending you. Love in me, Lord. My love is so blemished. Mm-hmm.